Well, hello and welcome to MeetWorks. I'm Joe Emenheiser with the University of Connecticut Extension. Uh, and here today we're going to talk about beef cattle and beef evaluation. Uh, one of the things that, that seems to be a knowledge gap uh, across the, the industry or with, with producers and consumers alike is the translation between live animals and beef carcasses and ultimately the product. And understanding that bridge uh, and bridging that gap is pretty critical to ensuring quality all the way through. Uh, so we'll talk about a couple of general things uh, that will help orient you to how cattle grow, how they develop, and how that ultimately translates to product quality at the end. Uh, we have two carcasses, two beef carcasses here today. Uh, came from two different animals, of course. Our animal number one on the left, these first two pieces are the, the, are the halves of that carcass. Okay, so to orient you, the hind animal is, is elevated in the air, the legs are pointing away, and what we're looking at is the backbone of the animal with the front of the animal toward the ground. Okay, both halves of carcass number one and both halves of carcass number two. Okay, these two animals um, were just randomly selected this morning and um, Interestingly enough, there's some, some differences we can talk about. Uh, for one, we have a heifer in number one and a steer in number two. Uh, some things that we expect to be different based on those sex classes are the rate of development, the ultimate weight that they reach a market weight, and where they deposit fat or muscle differently. Okay, heifers are expected to reach a market weight or a constant level of fat at a lighter weight they're earlier maturing and slightly fatter. They also have different types of fat. We don't see that as well from this angle, uh, but a heifer has a presence of utter fat uh, where a steer would have cod fat. Uh, just different textures of fat that we can see on the other side. Okay, a heifer is earlier maturing, and so we would expect a heifer to be the same degree of fatness at a lighter weight. Interestingly enough, we have two slightly different weights uh, represented between these carcasses. And the heifer carcass is about 650 pounds. The steer carcass is about 820 when we combine the two uh, half weights together. Okay. Some industry terminology that's important. Uh, when these animals come in, we take a live weight. Okay. The live weight for both of these was in excess of 1,300 pounds. The heifer weighed 1,303 pounds live. The steer was 1,391 live, okay? So slight differences in, in live weight, but a much broader difference in carcass weight, okay? The heifer, like I said, is approximately 650 pounds. The beef carcass, or the steer carcass, 820, okay? When we divide the hot carcass weight, which is the weight going into the cooler, by the live weight, we get what's called a dressing percentage. Dressing percentage is somewhere in the 62% range uh, for beef cattle, and both of these are slightly below that. The steer is about 59%, the heifer carcass is just over 50%. Okay, when we have that low of a dressing percentage, we wonder about what might be influencing that. And with a heifer, there's always the possibility that there was a pregnancy uh, that's not reflected in the carcass weight. The more muscle that's on a beef carcass, the higher the dressing percentage will be. Also, the fatter an animal, the higher the dressing percentage will be. Things that can negatively affect dressing percentage are, for ruminants, the amount of rumen fill that's, that's in the body uh, of the animal, or the hide. How much hair is on the hide? How wet is that hair? Is it full of dung balls and other things that ultimately don't get reflected in the carcass weight? But we try to target uh, a dressing percentage in the 62% range, understanding that there's going to be some breed differences, uh, some sex differences, and some seasonality differences uh, that would be normally expected. Beyond dressing percentage, Understanding the tissues of the body and how those change with growth is critically important for understanding 
the ultimate product quality, but also the production economics of beef cattle. And all sectors of the industry need to be viable, need to be profitable, and need to produce a quality product for the entire chain to be sustainable. Okay? So there are some tissues and some growth patterns that are economical on a production efficiency uh, standpoint that don't translate to ultimate product quality. And making sure that all those things are optimized so that all links of the chain can be viable is going to be critical for developing, developing the local systems uh, that we try to, uh, try to achieve here in New England. The three tissues of primary importance in cattle and in beef carcass and beef cut evaluation are muscle, fat, and bone. Relative percentages of muscle, fat, and bone change throughout the growth curve of the body. Bone achieves, after a an early point of skeletal growth, um, relatively levels off and stays constant as a percentage of body weight. Muscle con continues to increase until it reaches a point uh, of, of physiological maturity, at which point it starts to level off. And fat increases roughly parallel to muscle, slightly lower percentage of body weight, to the point of physiological maturity, and then it will increase potentially exponentially, uh, whereas the other tissues stay constant. Finding the point of physiological maturity that's optimal is important for product quality, but also important for production economics. Because if we continue to feed an animal past that point, the weight that it will continue to gain is due primarily to fat, its average daily gain will decrease, and its feed efficiency will suffer as a result of both of those things. The more fat that we put on an animal past a certain point, the more that will detract from the yield of that animal. Here in New England, we don't have a wide presence of USDA grading. Okay? In the plants that we have, which are relatively smaller, we don't assign USDA yield or quality grades to carcasses. However, the factors that influence those grades are important regardless of whether they are graded for commerce or not because the attributes that influence USDA yield grade or USDA quality grade are ultimately the determinants of the yield of that carcass, the percentage of boneless, closely churned retail cuts that will come from a carcass, or the quality as an indicator of the tenderness, juiciness, and flavor over and overall palatability of that carcass. Okay. Being able to optimize yield and quality grade, or the attributes that affect yield and quality grade, and deliver them consistently from one carcass to the next, one animal to the next, timing the harvest of that animal to coincide with optimums in yield and quality grade is important for developing a local industry, deport, deport, important for developing a consistent brand, and ultimately important for making people want to come back a second time and a third time to purchase and consume that product. Okay. USDA yield grade, or beef cattle yield grading, <clears throat> is determined by back fat thickness. If we measure the fat thickness opposite the loin eye muscle here in this carcass, which is ribbed open between the 12th and 13th ribs, that's the interface between the wholesale rib and the wholesale loin. We measure the, the back fat thickness, three quarters of the distance of the rib eye. And this heifer carcass is right about a half inch. Okay, optimal is slightly less than that, about four tenths of an inch. On this steer carcass, <clears throat> immediately opposite the, the ribeye, there's only about two tenths. But because that's a single measure, it's critically important to consider the rest of the carcass and to adjust that measurement as a result. Simply because of how this carcass uh, the hide was removed and the slight fat tearing right at that location, there's less fat right at that spot than there is anywhere else immediately nearby. So we would adjust that up slightly. And this beef carcass has not quite as much uh, subcutaneous fat 
but almost as much, and I would say uh, it would adjust to about four tenths of an inch. Okay, so we have three types of fat in beef carcasses. Subcutaneous, which is external fat. Intermuscular fat, which is fat between the muscles. That's particularly common in the, in the forequarter of the beef, the chuck uh, being the wholesale cut that corresponds with that most. And intramuscular fat. Intramuscular fat is fat within a muscle. In layman's terms, we refer to intramuscular fat as marbling. And marbling becomes one of the primary determinants of quality grade. Again, even if we don't assign quality grades to these carcasses, the attributes that indicate those, those, those grades down the road are strong predictors of the palatability and the quality eating experience from that carcass. Okay. So we'll, we'll return to intramuscular fat uh, or marbling in a little bit. But not to get away from yield grading, we have fatness opposite the ribeye. We adjust that for external fat. We also consider the amount of kidney, pelvic, and heart fat internal to the body. And the other consideration for USDA yield grading, or the yield of a carcass in general, is the ribeye size. We measure that ribeye with this dot grid. I lay that on there, I count the number of dots, divide by a factor, and that gives me a ribeye size. I adjust the yield grade based on the size of that ribeye, the area of that ribeye, relative to the carcass weight. Both of these ribeyes are about 14 and a half square inches. They're pretty good size. Okay? For a carcass of this weight, 650 pounds, that's an exceptionally large ribeye. That will have a beneficial effect on the yield grade of this carcass. We're not gonna go into the full yield grade calculations. We'll just stick with the basic principles. Um, but understand that even though this heifer has slightly more fat, she's got a large ribeye relative to her carcass weight, that will adjust her yield grade down. Slightly leaner carcass uh, with the same size ribeye, but a smaller ribeye relative to carcass weight, that's going to have an effect on yield grade. All of these things are important because they indicate the percentage of closely trimmed retail cuts that will come from the carcass and ultimately from, from the beef animal. Okay? The higher that percentage, the less waste there is in external fat that's trimmed off or seam fat that ends up being trimmed off or left in a cart cut that's cooked down uh, and doesn't end up as edible product. When it comes to quality grade, there's a number of things that are considered. Uh, the maturity of the carcass is critically important. Uh, we measure that by the percentage of ossification in the thoracic buttons and also the color of the lean. Uh, but both of these are solid A maturity uh, beef carcasses, meaning they're young cattle. We don't need to worry about age. Uh, and so the primary determinant of quality grade is the degree of marbling in the ribeye. A grader will assign a quality grade based on visual appraisal of the amount of marbling exposed in the ribeye. For those of us that don't do this every day, um, we, we have from the American Meat Science Associate, er, Association uh, marbling cards that can give us a benchmark or a comparison for the different quality grades. If we were to zoom in on this ribeye, uh, this heifer, the degree of marbling or intramuscular fat within the ribeye puts her in the low select quality grade range. The steer carcass has considerably more intramuscular fat or marbling. There's not only a higher percentage of intramuscular fat, but it's more finely textured and more evenly distributed throughout the eye. This would put the steer carcass in the premium choice quality grade. Even though, unlike commodity industry, these carcasses are not marketed based on their quality grade, the attributes are important. We would expect 
this low select grading carcass to have less palatability than this premium choice. Quality grades start at prime, go down through choice, select, and below that is standard. Right? There's a big, big price break, especially right now, between select and choice quality grades. Even if producers are not directly rewarded for that quality grade, it's still important to strive for the attributes of a higher percentage of marbling that's more evenly distributed throughout the eye. That affects everything from visual appraisal on the shelf to the palatability of the product. So when we back up and consider all the factors uh, that we use to evaluate quality grade, but also just general evaluation of beef carcasses, there are a number of factors that are in play. Okay, we have a heifer carcass that we expect to finish earlier. We have a steer carcass that we expect to be at the same degree of fatness at a slightly higher weight. Interestingly enough, the heifer carcass has more fat than the steer carcass. If these were still live growing animals, there would be decisions to make at the producer level as to when the optimum time to harvest them would be. Producer wants to optimize everything from their feed efficiency to the yield and the quality of that beef animal. Sometimes, if we have a lightweight animal, like I would consider this 650 pound carcass to be relatively lightweight. Sometimes, if we have a lightweight carcass, a little bit more time on feed allows that animal to reach a higher quality grade or a higher degree of marbling, which can add considerable value to the palatability of that carcass. <clears throat> In this heifer's case, we can see that the amount of external fat that she's depositing is, is exceeding the intramuscular fat capacity that she has, okay? That is a limitation at the genetic level. And there's not an opportunity certainly for a carcass to reproduce, uh, but there's not an opportunity to change the genetics of a growing animal. Genetics are changed by making breeding decisions. And so to integrate this entire industry, it's important that the information that we find here in the cooler that ultimately goes to the retail case also goes back to the producer level. And we use that information to make decisions in terms of genetics, which bulls to keep for breeding, which heifers to keep for breeding, and also in terms of market readiness. At what point in the growth curve is this heifer most appropriately harvested? And arguably, even though her marbling is not where we would like it to be, that's the extent of her genetic potential. So the optimum harvest endpoint for her would have been slightly earlier where there would be less external fat and less waste. Okay. That puts her in a lighter carcass weight range, but sometimes lighter carcass weights are appropriate for the breed or for the production system. If we have more heritage-oriented breeds or more of a grass production system, an earlier maturing, lighter weight animal can be totally appropriate. What doesn't change though across those production systems is the concept of finding the optimal endpoint in terms of physiological maturity that's going to optimize production efficiency, yield, and quality. This steer carcass ended up just about where we wanted him to be in terms of optimizing age, growth efficiency, yield, and quality. Okay, the steer has just about the optimal degree of, of back fat. If we were to nitpick, we would ask that to be a little bit more dis evenly distributed throughout the body, perhaps the degree of finish uh, being smoother. But in terms of fat thickness, muscle size, overall carcass weight, and the degree of marbling present, 
this is a pretty decent kind of beef carcass. Again, there are likely some production differences in how these two animals were produced. It's totally fine and there's all sorts of room for multiple breeds, multiple production systems, but the attributes that we look at in the carcass to determine are they going to be profitable for the producer? Are they going to be profitable for the packer if they, if they uh, take ownership? Are they going to be palatable and consistent for the consumer? Those attributes are consistent. It doesn't matter how they're produced. It doesn't matter what breed they are. We need to pay attention to how animals grow, how that affects feed efficiency, carcass yield, and quality. There's a lot to consider. There's a lot more uh, to be discussed at some point and to start to think about some of the concepts that ultimately affect the viability of the entire industry. It's an exciting time for beef production in New England. Demand for local product is as high as it's ever been and that doesn't promise to decrease. But as we ramp up production to meet that demand, it's critically important that we meet it with quality, consistent product. Understanding the attributes that affect viability for the entire industry is critically important. I hope this has helped you to consider those things, and if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you.